Welcome to Moving Pictures on the BBC World Service, the series that explores great artworks. I'm Cathy Fitzgerald, and today's painting is a little devilish. The Temptation of St Anthony, painted around 1650 by the Flemish artist Jus van Kraalsbeek. It comes from the collection of the Staatliche Kunsthalle Karlsruhe in Germany. And if you'd like to see it and follow along as we take a closer look at its demonic temptations, head to the Moving Pictures page of the BBC World Service website and follow the link to explore the painting. You'll be taken to a super high-resolution image made by Google Arts and Culture. Click on it to zoom in. If you dare. When you look at this painting, what kind of agency do you find in it? The painting is actually full of demonic work. Demons, devils, ghosts. Terror, bewilderment, panic. The world's gone upside down. Things are awry. Things are not what you would expect them to be. St. Anthony went into the wilderness to be alone in prayer. This made the devil so angry. He tormented the saint with hallucinations, conjuring a dark and hellish landscape. The devil called forth demons of every shape and size to either terrify the saint or to lure the saint into sins. Snakes, fire, creepy crawlies, dangerous things, one imagines. It's an um, explosion of it's things an, demonic. It is an explosion of things demonic. You can see the saint on the far right-hand side of the picture. He sits under a dead tree, wearing coarse brown robes, has a weather-beaten face and a wispy white beard. Lelia Packer, curator of paintings at the Wallace Collection. St. Anthony seated with a book, probably the Bible. You can see he's got his fingers in between many of the pages, so he's really studying it very closely. And then he's also got his beautiful little sketchy image of the crucifix on the tree right beside him. All around him are these little devils, including this woman who is probably the devil queen. And here she's tempting him through lust. She's exposing her chest. It's almost like she's pulling aside her shirt. And she's also tempting him with luxurious objects like this nautilus shell cup which is enticing so the riches of the world and you can see that he is looking in her direction so he is possibly considering these temptations who who wouldn't (laughs) he's thinking about it yes exactly his gaze is directed towards her Stuart Clark emeritus professor of history at Swansea University he is actually not looking where he should be looking he's turning his eyes to look at the woman. But we can tell that she's a demon because of her feet. Well, can't we? that's the giveaway. Um, he can't see her feet because they're not in his line of sight. But we can see that she's got claws on her feet. So that tells us immediately, of course, that she's an apparition. In the shadows behind him, there's a goat. It has white whiskers and a curved horn, flecked with tiny streaks of yellow that give the appearance of ridges. In the Middle Ages, goats were said to whisper lewd thoughts into the ears of saints. Maybe that's what this one's up to. Look to the right of Anthony, at the tree trunk. Even in places where you might not expect, in the hollow of the tree, there's a little devil coming out. That might be difficult to see at first, and he's right behind Anthony, and he's the palette in which he's painted is very similar to Anthony's cloak and the tree trunk itself, so he's almost in camouflage. So from all sides, he's receiving these temptations. He looks a small figure, huddled on the far right-hand side of the painting at the bottom. The picture is dominated by the surreal image of a giant head floating in the sea. A man's face, eyes bulging with fear, mouth open, in a scream perhaps. And clambering around the giant's head, a swarm of evil. Tiny demons, naked and human seeming, but marked by curling tails and strange heads. Furry, feathered, horned. 
the little hybrid creatures made from disparate animals. Demons, devils, monsters. Think how much fun the artist must have had dreaming them up. One of my favourites is back on the right-hand side of the painting, in the foreground. A little salmon pink crab-like critter with six jointed, rather elegant legs. Probably started out looking at a crab, then thinking about perhaps a spider, some kind of insect. But what I really love about it is the way he decorates it with these swirls, these circular swirls of different colours. The variety of colours is incredible in thinking about this beautiful insect's tail, which is quite transparent. And he's really placed it quite centrally in the foreground, so you are meant to look very closely. And then there's this large egg which has been broken and out of it are all these serpents coming out and they have these amazing red tongues that are actually made of arrows. Some of the pieces of shell are still flying through the air, propelled by the force of the egg's contents. Flashes of red, black, blue and yellow yolk, symbolising the original sin. The moment evil burst into the world. If you look closely, there's a rock in front of the egg with two initials, CB, for the artist, Krasbeg. What do we know about him? Not much. Holger Jakob Friesen, creator of the Old Master Paintings Gallery at the Staatliche Kunsthalle Karlsruhe. We know that he was born around 1605 in a small town in Brabant, which is Belgium, 30 kilometers east of Brussels, as a son of a baker. And he himself became a baker and subsequently moved to Brussels and became a master in the Painters Guild in 1651. This is one of his best paintings. The picture's full of detail. Even in the little foreground area we've been looking at, there's more to notice. There's a lot of animals riding other animals, and a beautiful instance of it is this creature on top of the egg, which makes another allusion to a butterfly with these beautiful wings, and again the swirls here in black and red, which are really a nice contradistinction to the very sharp triangular edges of the wings. And these monsters are meant to be enticing. They're meant to tempt you. They're meant to be marvelled at. And as such, they have a lot in common with the contents of that great invention of the early modern period, the Curiosity Cabinet. Joseph Kerner, Professor of Art History at Harvard University. The place of such a painting, as well as the place of such hybrids, is the world of the proto-modern museum, a world where art objects, like this amazing painting, natural artifacts like fish skeletons and strange eggs, ostrich eggs, and particularly abnormalities of nature, two-headed fish, monstrous creatures, but also misshapen births, all of these misshapen creatures are kept in the same space. And the idea was that the anomaly, the strange object, be it natural, like a monstrous fish, or artistic, like a painting of monstrous fish, both had their place in this cabinet dedicated to this particular human drive, let's say, called curiosity. Krasbeck was painting in the 17th century a time when the very idea of what it meant to be curious was changing. Curiosity in the Middle Ages was seen as a sin. If you said to somebody, your child's very curious, back then it would have been a bad thing. The child's curious, uh, which means that they are turning away from God. But around this time, curiosity takes on a new form, much more like we would say curiosity today. If somebody says, my children are curious, you'd be proud because that's what children are supposed to be. And so in this period, then, curiosity can have both of those meanings. But where does that leave us? Because if we're being invited to be curious about all these tiny little hybrids and critters, where does that leave us as viewers? We are left in an extremely ambivalent place, and this is deliberate. So the painting then 
shows a story which should wag its finger moralistically at you not to look at these curiosities, just like St. Anthony. Yet, the whole picture knows, it knows that you're going to abandon St. Anthony for the wonderful curiosities which it displays. So it's a seduction. It's a seduction that knows it's a seduction and also knows that that seduction is morally or ethically problematic. Stuart Clark, Isn't this a painting not just about Satan, but it's of Satan? And the most important kind of agency in this painting is demonic, isn't it? Maybe casting its spell over you, unless you're able to view it in this dispassionate St. Anthony way, you're going to be caught up in it yourself. You suddenly turned into a very dark radio <laughs> program. <laughs> I don't want to exaggerate this. I don't want to say that the painting is only about this, but it's there. So is this painting meant to send us quaking to our knees in prayer? Not quite. That level of fear belongs to earlier centuries and earlier painters of diableries or devil scenes, such as the 15th century Netherlandish artist Hieronymus Bosch. It may be that in 1650, the painter is able to be slightly ironic about this, whereas in the case of Bosch, um, the issues would have been considerably more serious, maybe taken more seriously, whereas in the middle of the 17th century, maybe they could have been beginning to be treated with a little bit more detachment and irony. Take another look at the monsters plaguing St. Anthony. Don't they seem a bit lacking in terror? And, you know, grrr. I think that's one of the features, perhaps, where one can locate a certain kind of uh, comedy. That is, that the creatures that are tormenting him are, in fact, rather cute and silly. So in front of him, there's this pig upon whom is riding a duck-like creature with some kind of strange red spraying out from behind it. There's often things being expelled from creatures' bowels. And then, rather hopelessly, a dog-slash-reptile is trying to keep the pig from progressing forward. It's a sort of mischievous uh, creature pulling on the pig. Now, this whole configuration, what is that? Is that actually tormenting the St. Anthony? No, it's, it's, it's a kind of funny parade, a carnivalesque parade, and this wonderful demonstration of how the artist can combine different creatures into one hybrid. Making monsters required skill. Whether you were stitching together a monkey and a fish to make a mermaid worthy of display in a curiosity cabinet, or conjuring a devilish hybrid in paint. The Italian polymath Girolamo Cardono, philosopher, gambler and brilliant mathematician, examined many of these fabulous creatures. And he made the wise ruling that you can tell a fake mermaid and a fake hybrid from a real one by looking at the joints. Because obviously if somebody comes with a fraudulent monster, if you look carefully at how the fish tail is attached to the upper part of the body, you see, oh, it's using glue or whatever, or it's, it doesn't really work. And so he always says you want to examine the attachments. And when artists from Hieronymus Bosch on do their monsters, one of the things they attend very closely to is how to make the transitions from one creature to another in a hybrid beast. Look to the left of St. Anthony and the woman. There's a strange white creature in the shadows, being ridden by a naked devil with a loot. Wes Williams, professor of French at Oxford University, an expert in the cultural history of monsters. This duck is a horse but he's also a unicorn because he's got... Um, it's just not a sentence I ever thought I'd hear. <laughs> There's the beak. You go back from the beak to the eyes and it's all fine. And then you go back to the top of the head and it's a duck, except it's got a great big horn coming out of the top, which is a unicorn horn. And then you look at the rest of the body from the neck downwards and it's a horse, but a sort of furry, feathery horse for the first half and the back half is more of a furry horse. And by the time you're back down to the feet... They're turkey feet, 
Um, so it's very, very tactile. And yeah, he's clearly trying to put together different touches. So the touch of feather, the touch of fur, but also the spikiness of the horn and maybe even the rubberiness of the beak. Can you see the little devil in front of the duck unicorn? He's carrying a knife that's almost as big as he is, symbolising anger, one of the deadly sins. This figure is wearing armour around his torso and a helmet on his head, which is beautifully painted so that the light is reflected off of that metal, that shimmering metal. And he's looking down and he's carrying this big knife. And you can see very interestingly how the knife has been painted after the legs of that creature behind it so that you see through the paint because it's painted quite thinly. And then you can see that the artist has changed his mind in terms of the position of those bird's legs. So there's what we call pentimenti or changes of mind of the artist where the legs would have been further back towards the left, closer to the little man. And that's why that back leg looks as if it's in slightly the wrong place. Yes, exactly. And I think that was to give room for the figure to have a bit more space around it to exist as a kind of single entity. The knife of the little devil points backwards, rather threateningly, towards two ducks, who balance on a plank of wood between the shore and the boat. Again, they don't look terribly frightening. One looks a bit like a mummy duck, and the other one's a little baby duck, and we know that because the smaller one is only just emerging from the egg. The egg which is around most of its body, its little legs are poking out the bottom, and what we have to call arms. And mum is very pleased that little duck has come out okay, I think. And little duck's looking up at mum duck, and it is a little family of ducks, except they're not ducks because they're upright. There's a kind of anthropomorphic human shape to what they're doing and to the way they're looking at each other. I was almost going to say talking to each other, <laughs> but certainly the way they're feeling each other. That's something that's going right across the picture. To the left of the ducks, there are three little monsters having a chat. One looks a bit like an evil Yoda. Next to them, two naked devils, hands placed mysteriously, seem to be enjoying each other's company. And then we reach the mouth of this strange, strange head. On the left, two naked demons try to climb in, dangling off the bottom lip. They have red eyes and odd faces. One a greeny yellow with a tentacle curling out of his forehead, the other with white spiky hair and two sharp white horns. And there are more tiny monsters just above them. Coming out of the the mouth is this green feathered demon with a furry hat. And he looks he, oddly like a Muppet, actually. He looks very Muppet-like, mm. but he's very charmingly giving a set of what seem to be terracotta pipes to this bird human creature who's looking extremely pleased with herself so it's a little love scene a little love vignette in the middle between the coy green monster who seems to be doing well and a slightly demure but completely perverse duck creature that he's giving it to so all of a sudden you're no longer in the realm of terrifying demonic possession but you're in some slightly silly scene between two very, very shy lovers. And behind them, there's a person looking straight out at us, holding his hand over his mouth. And you don't know, is he about to laugh or is he, is he spooking us? But then you really get lost because as you go into the mouth, you are in a world onto itself like a little hell. Can you see the little red eyes glowing in the darkness? Wes Williams thinks viewers of the time might have seen a connection between these demonic apparitions and the white pipes the little green monster is handing out. What tobacco and pipes generally were used for is a kind of mild to not very mild intoxication. So you'd either, on your own, but more usually in company, smoke a pipe, find yourself transported maybe into a world of hallucinogenic creatures like the ones in this painting. So that suggests that it was a lot stronger than just tobacco or cigarettes now. Yeah, it's much, much stronger. I don't want to overstate it. It's not that all of these guys are involved in this. It's just that that's one way in which hallucinogenic experiences can be accessed in the time. 
So there is a sense that perhaps this could be a smoker who's just had a few pipes too many. <laughs> yes, I guess so. And his teeth would suggest that as well. He's got bad teeth. Uh, yeah, he's literally blown his mind at the top. Yeah, I'd go with that. We can be pretty sure that the artist enjoyed a pipe or two himself. Crasby painted several scenes of smokers, including one now held in the Louvre that's believed to be a self-portrait. The man in that painting, shown puffing on a pipe, has long brown hair, a brown moustache, wild eyes, and a definite resemblance to our giant. So it's very likely that this weird floating head is actually another self-portrait, which makes what's going on inside his head even more intriguing. The skin of the forehead has been peeled back and you peer into the brain. You see a little scene in which an artist is at work drawing on a canvas or panel. So you're looking at a painting, you see the portrait of the artist who painted it, and you see into, through this very, very crude and bizarrely anatomical display of what is going on in his head, you see a little homunculus of the painter at work imagining and calling forth an image. And it looks as if he's painting a scene of people in a brothel or in a kind of inn, because one of the subjects of the picture, as happens when people are painting, has come up to the painter and wants to peek at the painting he's doing. So what he's doing is painting naturalistically the most elemental of human things, people eating, drinking, throwing up, whatever. These types of naturalistic tavern scenes, known as the low-life genre, were typical of Flemish art at this time, and Krasbeck's stock in trade. So what's he up to? Well, showing off in a way. Look, he's saying, I can paint from life, the ordinary, everyday stuff of existence, but I can also create these fantastical, nightmarish creatures. I can do both. To do a good creature means that you have to do the bits and pieces of it in very naturalistic ways. So if something has the head of a rabbit and the body of a person, the head of the rabbit has to be well done with the fur and the ears all correct. So it's one of the funny, deliberate ironies of this kind of art that this demonstration of something that's not natural is done in an extremely naturalistic way. Look over at the far right-hand side of the painting, at the tree. There's a terracotta pot perched in its branches above St Anthony. You see the shadows on the one side and the darker shadows as you look into the mouth of the pot and it's graced by a very, very beautifully executed highlight or even two highlights. And the highlights, just to give you a sense of how well it's done, aren't just like a little point of light. They're modified by the semi-sheen but rough character of a terracotta pot. So if you own one of these pictures, you probably long ago have enjoyed and gotten maybe even sick of all the bizarre creatures and the fun that they are giving you. But nonetheless, you then have amazing fun with just one of the pots and how beautifully it's painted and how the content spills and drips down the trees, threatening the woodcut of Christ on the cross. Joseph Kerner also admires the way the landscape is painted, over on the far left of the painting. An armada of tiny boats crammed with demons stretches back to the horizon beneath a patch of beautifully painted, almost luminous, night sky. When you look deep into this fabulous, dark, gloomy, stormy hellscape, uh, figures upon figures upon figures into almost an infinite distance, it's a very natural, deep, deep horizon which glows as a result of the beautiful way it's painted. And, you know, challenge anyone to paint that way. That is not something that you can do unless you are masterful at painting is to be able to move smoothly seamlessly from capturing things 
in their quiddity, we might say, in their thingness. And then the paint also, at certain points in the picture, fades away into something that's shadowy and thin and transparent. So you got a close-ups portrait and a landscape, actually. A monstrous portrait, but it's a close-up portrait, and then you have this fabulous landscape in the background. The painting is so rich, and it's so detailed, and there's so much going on that's fascinating and intricate. And of course, time was slowed down <laughs> much more in the 17th century than it is for us today. I think people would have taken the time to really spend in looking at a painting like this, and they would have had discussions around it. So this is a conversation piece as much as anything else where people would have gathered and conversed. And I think this series does exactly that. It brings us back to the way of looking, maybe, at least in terms of the amount of detail that we're looking at and the time that we're spending with the picture. We're back in 17th century time. Yes. <laughs> Moving Pictures was presented and produced by Cathy Fitzgerald. It was a white stiletto production for the BBC World Service.